We can't take the interest rates lower and we can't borrow our way out of this because nobody's got any debt capacity. The balance sheet recession idea is very important. One of the reasons that this is fundamentally different than most of the recessions we've had in this country is that it's, it's, it's not just that we overexpand and whatnot. We leveraged the hilt out of our houses and we used that money to go buy TVs, to buy second houses, to buy cars, to take vacations. All that stuff is fine, but we weren't using that money to go out and build factories. We bought a lot of stuff. When we couldn't borrow against our houses anymore, we couldn't buy a bunch of stuff. So business really suffered. Global trade went down almost 10%. These guys, the banks, loan money to the businesses to make stuff, and they loan money to us to buy stuff. The idea was we would be able to borrow and spend forever and they would be able to grow forever. When those two pieces of the equation fell apart, these guys got hammered. This is why we have a banking crisis. They again, you've got five to seven trillion dollars in assets supporting something around 100 to 120 trillion dollars in loans. There is no way the math works. Everything we're doing around the world right now is designed to prop up the banking system because the fear is if one large bank goes under, they all go under. And there may be truth to that. In fact, at some point, there is truth to that. Ultimately, though, you cannot create enough money to save them. One day, they will go under. Now, let's take a look at the components of it on the consumer side. All right, stay with me on this. What this says, if you look at the blue line, is the United States. There's, by the way, a housing bubble in Canada right now. We can talk about that if you want. If you go back and say, in 1990, what was the average amount of equity somebody had in their house? And we index that to 100. What you see is as housing prices went up, a whole bunch of equity. Well, now two things have happened. We've borrowed a lot of money against those houses, plus housing prices have come down. The average person today has the same amount of equity in their houses that they had in 1978. They have lost a tremendous amount of value. A few months ago, I read somewhere that the average person currently has less than six months income in equity in their house. And that is the first time since the 1950s that's been true. Historically, the house has always been the safe store of value. If you lost a job, you needed to send a kid to college, you wanted to retire, whatever it was, you could go to the house for money. There is no more money in the house. And the reality also is there's nobody to sell the house to. If we look at non-housing assets, basically stock portfolios, what you find is we're back where we were about 10 years ago. People are feeling poor because they are poor. Their incomes aren't going up, their net worth is in fact going down. Business is in the same boat. What this shows us is in the red is government borrowing, the blue is effectively business borrowing. When business borrows money, one of two things happens. It either uses the money productively or it goes bankrupt. And both of those things can happen. But what's happening because of, of the change in the economy is that business is actively deleveraging. Business is trying to actually refinance or repay debt. Government is stepping in to make up the difference. Is that helping support the economy? Yes. But ultimately, it cannot create value. Government, all it can do is take money from you and give it to me or vice versa. It cannot create anything new. Whoa, but what about all these green energy companies? Well, what about them? There's plenty of venture capital out there. If they were good investments, the private sector would do it. What is happening right now is it's theft. They're taking money from other people, giving it to their favored political cronies, and it's not creating value, and these companies are going under left and right. The problem with not taking the hit now and not taking the hit a few years ago when we should have taken it is, one day all this money has to get paid back, and that is going to cost us for years, if not decades, to come. The government. If you look at Japan's situation, if you just look at how much they pay for the money they've already borrowed and their equivalent of Social Security, that is all the tax revenue they collect. Every other dollar that gets spent in Japan is borrowed. We are actually getting very close to that. If we look at the United States, based on various measures using reasonable assumptions, the federal government's current fiscal policy is unsustainable. Continuing on this imprudent and unsustainable path will gradually erode, if not suddenly damage, our economy, our standard of living, ultimately our domestic tranquility and national security. 
When I first read this, I focused on the domestic tranquility and national security side. What this person's really saying is, if we keep spending money like this, we might see riots in the street, we may not be able to defend ourselves. You may think we should have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you may think we had no business over there. Reasonable people can disagree. You may think we should be doing something about Iran and in Syria. You may think we should have nothing to do with that. Again, reasonable people can disagree. But here's the problem. If you think you should be doing something in those places, but you can't because you're broke, that's the problem. And that's what this person is pointing out. I have been using this quote since I first read it in January of 2007. David Walker was effectively the head accountant for the United States. He's a nonpartisan guy. Clinton put him into office. He stayed working under Bush. This is part of the executive summary to the annual report, official government document. And what he said five years ago is, if we keep doing what we're doing, this is not going to be good times. Shortly thereafter, he left. You can see him on TV a lot. He goes around basically telling the world this is not going well. Now, let me ask you, are things better now on this front than they were five years ago? Are we doing a better job on the budget? I would argue not. Okay. Here's the deal. At the end of 2006, and these are phony numbers, we'll get into this, but basically we told the world we had about $8 trillion in debt. We are now at over 15 trillion, almost 16, and in fact, we have crossed this 100% line. The debt clock. This is as of a couple weeks ago, and I just want to show you a few things. I know this is hard to see. What we officially acknowledge is money we've borrowed is about just about 16 trillion dollars. The gross domestic product, everything we essentially spend in this country, is about 15 trillion dollars. So when you look and you want to have that apples and apples of debt to GDP, we have now crossed that 100% barrier. There's some research out there that says once you cross about 85, 90%, it costs you about 1% of gross domestic product growth. A couple of other things to note here. The first thing is that right now we're paying about $225 billion a year just in interest on the debt. This is because we can borrow money at less than 2%. We start having to pay, if we owe $16 trillion, and your interest rates go up 1%, that costs you another $160 billion a year. You go to 6% interest rates, all of a sudden I'm having to come up with about $800 billion a year just to pay the interest. Where's that $600 billion going to come from? You're not going to be able to raise it in taxes. No one's going to have the guts to cut it out of spending. All it's going to be is more debt and more borrowing. We are headed toward a big doom loop. And this is one of the reasons they don't want to raise interest rates. You and I also owe about $16 trillion. This is individual debt. $13 trillion of it is what we owe on our houses, about 30% of which right now are underwater. That's not a good thing. All this, in fact, is a bad thing. Oh, one other point here. We spend about $3.6 trillion a year. We bring in about $2.2 trillion a year. So this number is growing by about, well, about 8, 9, 10% a year. Last year with the budget deal on the debt ceiling increase, they said if we do this, even with the cuts that there were in those plans, we were going to be at $24 trillion in debt within 10 years. Keep that in mind for a moment. All right. All bad, not the problem. Here's the problem. We have promised people about $16 trillion in Social Security benefits that we don't have the money for. This is not the cost of the program. It's what we can't afford. $20 trillion in prescription drugs and $82 trillion in Medicare. Medicare is the black hole. Could you fix Social Security by raising retirement ages means testing? Yeah, you can do that. You can't fix, you can't fix Medicare. And the reality is that the overhaul that would be required to keep Medicare going, you'd never get through politically. You know, last year, Paul Ryan, whether you like his plan or not, came up with a plan. And the first thing was we were going to push grandma over, grandma over a cliff in a wheelchair. Okay. I mean, you know, and that's, and that's what's going to happen. It, those, the demagoguery will be unbelievable. So if we put this into stuff we can understand, if this is your household budget, you make $50,000 a year, you spend $82,000 a year, and you have promised people you're going to pay them about $4 million bucks. Okay. What are the chances you're good for this four mil? I will argue very small. Okay. And the reality is, is, is we're increasing the spending every year. Even when we're cutting, all we're doing is cutting the rate of growth. We pretended last year that we cut our spending by the equivalent of $640 this year. We actually are spending more. We didn't cut anything. But even if we were going to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, now we're only going to spend $81,360. We're still only making $50, and we're still 
committed to the four million. This is why I say, do you want to bet that Medicare and Social Security are going to be there for you? There's not a chance. If you're trying to draw the current benefits 10 years from now, I think there's no chance of that happening. We use the way forward machine. We get in with Sherman and Peabody, and we go to this day in 2016. This assumes we don't make any major changes, which I believe is the most likely case because no one's got any guts to do anything. In four years, we're at 22 trillion. Now remember, if we did everything right in 10 years, we were at 24. We're just not even dealing with reality here. So now we're at 22, gross domestic product, and I think this is aggressive, is at about 17. Interest on the debt is 451, and that assumes no increase in interest payments. We have increase, excuse me, in, in interest rates. You have increase in interest rates, this number is gonna be close to a trillion dollars. We're only bringing in two trillion. So half of all the money we bring in is gonna go just to paying interest on the debt. How are we gonna come up with another 800 or 750 billion dollars? Social Security, because we're all older now, is 20 trillion in the hole. Prescription drugs are 27 trillion in the hole. Medicare alone is over 100 trillion dollars in the hole. There is no possible way that those things can be fixed. According to this, what it tells us our unfunded liabilities are about $146 trillion. It's worse than that, and we'll get into that in a little bit. If we now look at the projections, and one thing that's really interesting, if you remember when we had those surpluses back in you know, 2000 and you know, the, the Clinton surpluses, the only reason there were surpluses is because we stole money from Social Security. We never lowered spending. We never did, okay? But this is what the government is telling us our little ramp is like. This, I will argue, is unattractive, okay? We're talking about, and this is, this is a US government document, this is coming from the Treasury, and what they're telling us is, and, and you can say, well, we won't be around here, and here's the problem, by 2027, you're bankrupt, okay? You're, I mean, you're bankrupt, bankrupt. There's just nothing that you can do. The reality is you're bankrupt now. But this is what our government believes is a some sort of reasonable plan where we're going to be sitting at debt to GDP of 300%. Who is going to give us money? We're laughing at Greece because they're at 130, 140%. Okay? There's no way we, that this is sustainable. In the famed words of Herbstein, if something can't go on, it won't.